And I'm going to start with a little story. Um, my name is Dr. Donique Dolly. My name is actually Dr. Donnie Kuaskia Dolly. Um, and my father would want me to say that correctly. Um, my father passed away in Oct on October 18th, 2016, while I was uh, in my first semester at Harvard um, for the graduate program. And at, during that summer, the summer following, I, I took a trip to Jamaica. I took a trip to Jamaica to clear my mind and uh, to find my roots, um, to, to work on my health. Uh, because when I was a principal, I was unhealthy. I was 20 pounds heavier. I would work, work, bust my butt for kids, bust my butt for kids, do whatever for kids. And then I eat or I wouldn't work out, but I do anything for kids. But then when it was time for me, it's like, oh, I'm gonna reward myself. So Jamaica for me was like getting away. And you know, I, I love Bob Marley, but I love Bob Marley because of he followed his own beliefs and he was plant-based. He, he ate a certain way. He, he followed a, a way of living that wasn't just the norm. Um, and he did it so proudly. And it was the first time me in Jamaica, I looked around and I saw black people who actually look slim, look healthy for the most part. And I was like, I gotta do something different. And I wanna be like this. So I just worked on changing my eating. But as I learned, there's so many more things you could do. So you from eating to working out to even the friends you have or who you hang out with or where you're at. Um, and that's what we're gonna go into today. Uh, it's important to me because I, I'm a person who took care of him, who, who finally took care of himself, but I have a friend who didn't, um, who didn't get that lucky and is not with us anymore. Uh, my friend Obi, Obadima, a Kobe, who was a principal. Again, busting the butt for kids, busting the butt for kids, doing anything for kids, elementary, middle school principal in Baltimore City. And she called me one day and she said, hey, um, I'm not feeling too well. Gotta go to the doctor. I think I got some in my lungs, but you know, I'll be fine. That was the last time I talked to Obi. Um, that was actually after my dad passed. And she died. Um, while in the hospital uh, with some failure to her lungs. Um, so it made me just pay attention to health. And so this is a serious one. It's, this is actually the third time we're talking about this, but we think of it like this. Like in the big picture school, a lot of people work on, let's say quantitative reasoning, right? You wanna get quantitative reasoning? You get a specialist who might help you figure out how to put math into your projects or into the school curriculum in a met-like way, a big picture-like way. Well, we're trying to do that with health. And we're thinking about, you know, the, the star of the show, this plenary is Dr. Marsha Gale Davis, who is gonna to talk to us, but she also is working and partnering with us in a way that she is the person who helps us understand how we can better inc inculcate health into our practices, into your schools, into um, your living, but also the students. And it's really about the students because the students aren't aware of, or can be more further made more aware of um, healthy lifestyles and how to, how to live and the dangers of sugar, salt, um, fat, and how that is pushed on us in our very own country. So I'm not in sunny Jamaica, but it's sunny. And I'm gonna pass this to Elliot because uh, what happened from there is Elliot was working on the same thing at the same time I was working on better than me. So Elliot, if you wanna take it and tell how you really tried to make it a bigger big picture initiative. Uh, sure, Donique. Thanks for the personal touch as always, or touches uh, to the parts of your life that impact all of us, um, our health and education, and they should be, go to, should be going together. And for some reason they've been broken apart for many, many decades. And we can see the repercussions of that. Um, yeah, we started on this road a long time ago with personal qualities. And uh, part of my own personal journey has been finding new forms and new measures always. And I always look for measures that are 
evidence-based and scientifically based that we can make into something real simple, things that people aren't measuring. And I was looking at exercise, sleep, eating well, moving towards a plant-based diet, all these things for decades. And finally, a funder came along, a friend, Jack Forrest, gave us money. And we talked about it just a little bit. And he turned us on to a group called the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, uh, which Dr. Marsha Gale Davis is a part of. She's a young director there. And the work is very simple. How do we take what we're doing already and take these six measures of exercise and sleep and eating well and mitigating stress and avoiding harmful substances and having healthy relationships and move them into learning plans, who am I projects, personal narratives, and how do our students uh, change the world? Uh, much like young people changed adults to stop smoking, wear seat belts, and in the case of the Little Rock Nine and the Civil Rights Movement, which as you'll hear from Dr. Marsha Gale, Danique, myself, health disparities are a civil right. This is a very large equity issue that's mostly ignored in schools. And we could argue that most schools, when students walk in, come out less healthy than they were walking in when they came in in, in the morning, walk out. So I'm going to take you through work that our partners, um, Fable Vision and ACLM, and our students, this is all student-driven work from schools all over the world. And our students are not working from one school, although they are working at their one schools, they're working across schools. And they completely co-designed the website, uh, the work that we're doing with Isari on social media to get the word out uh, on the content that they're producing and development of an app that helps you manage uh, your healthy lifestyle. Uh, they changed the name and I'm going to share my screen and take you through it. And as I do, I'm going to ask uh, our students to say a few words about the parts that they did to get started. So we get their voices in here. Can everybody see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. And students get off mute there. So when you hear your name, say something if you're in the audience already. Uh, this is an odd time for some students, so we'll do the best we can. So when we click on, this is what we come to. And we have a Skunk Works team. Uh, some of these students are here with us. Uh, Angel, I don't know if you're here. Angel, you here? I'm here. I'm he How's it going there, Angel? Is that you? Yeah, I'm good. All right. Tell us what you've done on the Skunk Works team quickly. All right, so some things I've done was I created a poster which has the six measures on it. And then I also added a QR code that directs people to this website so they can learn more about it and just to stay more healthy. Thank you, thank you. And these, these were the students who were interested in web design, social media, and put this site together. Alicia, you here? Yeah, I'm here. Alicia is from Mumbai. What time in the morning is it? 1.30. A.M. That's A.M. All right. That's right. You all heard it. She gets the award for late night or early morning. Go ahead, Alicia. What have you been doing? Um, so uh, me and a couple of students internationally from Kenya, Idaho, and Italy and Mumbai have been working together to pull together a podcast. And we've also like created a blog um, on how to start a wellness project. Um, which is something we did with Andrea and on just how um, students from other schools can take initiative and start their own wellness project in their schools and start spreading the spreading the word about you know the six measures or just taking initiative in general. Great, great, Andrea. You want to say something from the Fable Vision side of things about working with our young people? I love working with your young people. Um, the highlight of my week has, well, last week was um, our Skunk Works team meeting and working with the students to help build out the website and um, gosh, 
<laughs> and, and the different ideas and they just keep coming. Um, if you guys haven't checked out Alicia's blog, her blog is so much fun. Check it on out. It is amazing. And you're going to see more as it comes through. Okay, you Riley. Know. Thank you, Andrea. Riley, you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi. All <laughs> right. Say a few words about what you've been doing. Um, I've also been helping out with Alicia on those Skunk Works meetings, and I created a little social media post, and you'll see that in the next page, probably. <laughs> yeah, you'll see it soon. All right. Maria, are you here? Maria's not here. She's at Odyssey, and Odyssey's been loomed large. They've done a number of webinars uh, for about a dozen schools. Paul, you want to say a few words? Uh, sure. Paul. Paul He's Hudak. Paul. Hudak. He's at Odyssey. Oh, Paul Hudak. Oh, where's Paul Hudak? Hey, Paul Reynolds. Good to see you. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, like Elliot said, I'm from Odyssey STEM Academy outside of Los Angeles. i um, been working with Big Picture a long time, and our scholars are putting together monthly webinars around this work. Um, a lot of the work we do is focused on environmental sustainability and environmental science, and the measures you're going to hear about today um, really organically tie into um, the work that we do. So we're super excited to be a part of this, and you get to hear from Rocio later on to talk about some of the work she's done that's been very important. Thanks, y'all. Yeah. Uh, Paul, you could say a few things too. Paul Reynolds from Fable Vision. Yeah. Well, I just you know we're we're thrilled. Fable Vision is thrilled to be you know, connected once again, connecting the dots with uh, big picture. And, you know, when Elliot brought this project up and we've done projects before, the Navigating Our Way film, the, the Get Real uh, graphic novel, when Elliot brought this project up, it was like a lightning bolt. And it's just one of those things, it's just so obvious. Of course, of course we should be talking about wellness and the way we live, not just the way we learn or get tested. Public school so, has it so wrong and, um, the, this is not just a project, this is a movement. And to Elliot's and, and Big Picture's um, you know, credit, the answer has to come from the students. And that is, you know, it's kudos to Andrea because logistically trying to coordinate students and literally all around the globe uh, to make this work has been, you know, a, a challenge, but a really good challenge. And I am I, I'm thrilled to see it already emerging so quickly and I really think that that big picture is going to make its mark in such a huge way. It is going to burst beyond big picture confines. And I, I hope, you know, five years from now, people say, remember when that movement happened around wellness and learning um, in that order um, or, or together, um, they're going to be saying big picture started it. So, you know, thrilled, thrilled and honored to be connected with everybody. Hey, thank you, Paul. This is definitely a we, a we with and I want. Mm. Uh, ben, you around? Yes, Ben's here? I, I Ben's am, from... I'm right here. Hi. Um, All right, Ben. Yes, I am from Nashville Big Picture High School in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I have been working on a uh, maybe long-term uh, social media uh, video series where I have made a script that is going on like a new, like um, that, that's along the lines of a news channel uh, explaining about uh, the six measures and like uh, tips for the six measures and what the six measures are. So me and Andrea have been uh, emailing back and forth after I showed her the script I wrote. So um, on, on like what, what the script is, what are, what are my plans for it? Um, and how we can incorporate it into either the website or the social media. Thanks. So that's what I've been doing. Great. And this, that's our Skunk Works team. But you ain't seen nothing because our students have produced content. Uh, uh, Marlene did this piece from Odyssey. Social media. This is Riley's work on Instagram. Angel mentioned the six measures. Sasha, you around? I know Sasha's around. Tamaya, you here? Yes, I'm here. All right, you want to tell people what you did, Tamaya? What you're doing? Um, yes, I wrote a poem about Brianna Taylor and the situation that was going on, and I shared it at the last big picture meeting, I believe. Yes. Uh, thank you. No, it was uh, very, 
intensely moving. I wrote about it in my TGIF, for those of you who get it. And it was a great experience of a, of a partnership that uh, Big Picture Nashville has with an organization called Love in the Real World that deals with um, uh, developing uh, healthy relationships. So those are the six measures. That's a little bit of the student um, showcase. And then we have Dr. Marshall Gale Davis, who's gonna be on soon, and Odilia. I, I've known Odilia for quite a while, um, and son even longer knows Odilia. She is going to be a graduate of College Unbound. Went yes. to the That's right, let's hear it. And she's our first uh, Lifestyle Fellow, although we're gonna change that name, Big Picture Living Fellow, because Lifestyle Fellow's already used. Odilia, you're gonna be working with Andrew's Advisory in uh, Providence, you want to say a few words about how this is your life's work? Yes, um, I, I was um, able to take a class with Elliot last semester, and it was on the six measures. Um, my project right now for College Unbound is to increase awareness of self-care, um, specifically to low-income parents. So the class I took on the six measures just, um, it just opened up my mind as to um, how to be aware of of, of, of myself, of, you know, my sleep, my eating, and I'm just happy to um, continue working on it. Thank you. Thank you. And as you could see, the blogs are starting. This is the conscious cabbage coming out. I think this is, uh, Alicia, this is yours, right? Yep. 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 So, so like I'm going to say, you ain't seen nothing yet. I see Martin, you came out of the woods of Eastern Oregon to join us for a second. You want, you want to say something? He's a, he's one of the, uh, uh, people that we connect with over at ACLM, and then I'll hand it back over to Donique and Marsha Gale to get us going. That uh, sounds good. Well, hey, greetings, everybody. Yeah, I'm, I'm Martin Tull. I'm the Deputy Director of Partnerships and Strategy for ACLM, and I've been working on this work for about five years now, and super excited to partner with Elliot and all of you guys to bring some of this work that's been happening in the healthcare space and make it more tangible and real and find ways that we can translate this so that it actually gets adopted. So super inspired to see how far you guys have come so far. Um, just know too, you know, I'd love to be a resource for all you guys in your various communities, um, help to connect you with ACLM members uh, in your regions or um, connect you with companies that are based there. Um, so as your projects get rolling, just know too that ACLM can be a resource for some of that work. And um, I'm just excited to see where you guys go with all this. Love the start. And um, I've already connected with a couple of you guys separately. So um, I'll put my email in the chat there as well. And I uh, look forward to also hearing from one of our board of directors, uh, Dr. Marsha Gale, uh, here shortly as well. So glad to join you guys. Thank you, Martin. And uh, we, we're going to be calling you more than you think, because we don't mess around when we got uh, people who can connect, we can connect to uh, our young people. And, and I'm just going to say we had a contest about naming the site, the logo, everything. This is all student driven, co-designed with students who want to do this work. There's a big we here. And now I'm going to turn it back over to, to Donique. Our students are going to be facilitating in the, and asking questions and facilitating in our breakout group. So thanks, everybody, for showing up. Donique. Cool. Thanks, oh, yeah. Elliot. Uh... Yeah, I want to start with, first of all, we're, we're plotting. This is a plan. We're plotting. So, you know, this is what we do. Um, first and foremost, this is a puzzle piece production. So this is also going to be a part of Puzzle Pieces the podcast. And um, as we plot, we want you to know that, yeah, students always are the ones who kick things off. If you didn't know, it wasn't Rosa Parks who kicked off the uh, bus boycott. It was Claudette Colvin, 15-year-old who's like, no, nah, I'm not getting off this bus. I'm not, I'm not moving my seat. Um, so Claudette Coven at 15 did that. Um, Ruby Bridges, which I mentioned all the time, she worked with the, her family worked with the MLACP and she sat in the principal's office for a year as being one of the students to break through and be in the first um, to integrate a school or desegregate, I should say. Um, so we need the students um, to put a little pressure. And then we need a professional to put on a little pressure to us professionals, us educators. And uh, sometimes we need somebody to speak our language. 
And so Marsha Gale speaks our language. Marsha Gale is not just a doctor, a person who's, who's looking into lifestyle medicine, who's dedicated, who's passionate about it, but she's also gifted. And just like many of us leaders here and students here and people who work in education atmosphere, what you do is not just what you do. It's you always add on to it. And what I mean by that is she has a, an immense talent uh, where she not only could talk and break down medicine, the math of it and the science, break down that science, but she can also throw down a verse and chop anybody down with the verse. So Elliot, let me let me get the sound for a second. If you could um, share your, let me share the screen. Well, I can't do nothing, but I know that somebody can share to help you do that. Yeah, there we go. You out, you out, Elliot. I'm in. Let me in. So I don't want to introduce Marsha Gale by just saying, "Oh, the pedigree is strong." You're like, "Oh, she did this." I want to have you listen to her. Because, you know, I'm tired of hearing, I don't want to hear about sugar, salt. I'm tired of hearing about the health disparities. I'm tired of hearing about the disproportionate number of African-American, Native, and Latinx people who are dying with COVID. And because all of it's whack, and I'm tired of it. So, Marsha Gale, before you get on, hopefully everybody can hear song that we're playing. If you can't hear that, let me know. Whack, whack, whack. If you can, just whack, try it out for me. Whack. Just, just whack. This is so whack. whack. This whole thing is just whack. whack. This whole situation is ridiculously whack. Held from this whack food with this whack mood. Whack cause we don't move. It's whack is just so whack. It's just whack, whack, whack. This is so whack. This whole thing is just whack, whack, whack. This whole situation is ridiculously whack. Held from this whack food with this whack mood. Whack cause we don't move. It's whack. It's just so whack, so whack. This is whack. I saw you take the chips and soda off the rack, put it right back. Because obesity will sneak up on you and attack the 1980s, cracking black, pushing the entire community back. That was whack. But in 2020, same story, Jack. Except it's high fructose corn syrup, that's basically sugar crack. Minority communities running rampant with the Big Mac. Or a box with jumping jack. Or a king who makes it your way like he's got your back. Listen to this. Then turn around, stab you in the back, be my so I can't see the back. Part of it's a clock with a nasty plaque. Get ready. Heart attack. Yeah. Can't even believe that And they put the blame on them Because they can't make it around the track I'm not on the multiple resources That they lack We're talking social determinants of health To be exact Cause lack of access to care Is common for brown and black And health disparities are quite the setback We already know that This is so whack It's whack So here's what we're gonna do Marsha Gale, you getting ready? Cause we get, we, we about to get this on and popping Students right. My challenge to you, I don't want you asking cute stuff like, hey, where are you from? No, we want to ask Marsha Gale some detailed questions after she's done, because we want to understand this, what is being done with us and healthy lifestyles. So please be ready to ask some strong questions. Now, Marsha Gale, yes. I'm just going to be quiet and let you rock it, because what you, <laughs> what's that song? That wasn't whack. It was actually really dope. All right. Kick your bars. Do what you do. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Donique. I'm actually going to go ahead and try to share my screen here. It's always a bit of a challenge, but we'll work it out. All right. There we go. All right. Can you all see that? And can you all hear me well? Okay, great. Um, thank you so much, Danik, for that introduction. I am Danik Sanatral. I told him that he should have done radio or should be doing radio because he's just, he makes, he makes all of it sound so good. Um, and I'm just grateful to have met Danik and Carlos and Elliot. And I am um, grateful to Jack Forrest, um, who is a friend of mine. He's kind of like a, a fairy god uncle <laughs> in the medical kind of um, community for me. I've known him since medical school and he's always been such a great support, um, especially for someone who is so passionate about prevention um, in the health community. Um, as a 
as a physician, that's not, as we understand, the focus of healthcare. So I am a bit um, in the minority, but I'm okay with that because I've always been okay kind of walking my own road or dancing to the beat of my own drum. Um, and so I am just grateful to have been connected to this brilliant and beautiful community. And I use those words very intentionally um, because of the collective intellectual power um, that creates an organization that dares to challenge the educational status quo. And I am also using the word beautiful because of what I see from the spirit and the heart of this community. I can sense it. I can sense it from people speaking to each other. I can sense it on Twitter when I see everyone like retweeting and, and just the way that you guys come together and support each other. And just what I see visually, the diversity of this community. So brilliant and beautiful is what I would characterize BPL as. Um, and I'm just incredibly excited to talk to you today about why this initiative is so, is so important. So I think we should start off with a couple of key questions. And that um, includes the first one. Why are you listening to a talk about health and an education leadership conference? Um, number two, what is lifestyle medicine? And three, what does it, this information help us understand um, about how we can help students and, and educators? So the first question, and I apologize about the lighting here. Why are you listening to a talk about health at an education leadership conference? So in order to really answer this question, you know, you have to have some context. And because I'm public health trained, context is really important when it relates to health. And so to give you a little bit of context, historically, when we look back, um, back into the 1900s and a bit before, the leading causes of disease were um, infectious diseases. And this was primarily due to the effects of the Industrial Revolution, where we had this mass um, change in society. There was this kind of rapid evolution in society where we had um, a great development in the types of communities that we had. And we went from kind of agrarian communities to urban communities. And with that, you had the development of these urban cities and overcrowding in poor housing and lack of infrastructure to really handle this rapid rise in the population. And so we see with that, we have these repeated outbreaks of various infectious diseases, including cholera and dysentery, tuberculosis, typhoid fever, um, yellow fever, et cetera. And those were really what we would consider the leading causes um, around that time. And what we understand is that Preventive efforts were really important in curving that trend. Um, the fact that infectious diseases were so paramount um, because of the way that society operated. It was because of these preventive measures that understood that at the root of this trend, at the root of these diseases, um, there was a problem and there was an environmental problem. And it was the way that the environment was exerting pressure, exerting an impact on health. And so as we kind of move to the 2000s, we see that there has been this really incredible shift in the type of diseases that are paramount, the type of diseases that are the leading causes of death. And we see here in the 2000s, particularly right now, and we'll kind of get to how that makes sense, um, we have chronic diseases as the leading causes of death. And that includes things like heart disease and cancer, stroke, lung disease, diabetes, and kidney disease. And um, just so you know, my my um, information is actually facts. Um, this is directly from the CDC National Vital Statistics. So this was looking um, at in the 1900s what, what really um, the leading causes of death were. And now we fast forward, forward to our time. And the leading causes of death are disability, um, the leading causes of death um, and also disability are what we call these chronic diseases. And they are called non-communicable diseases or lifestyle related diseases or um, food-borne diseases. That's how we characterize them. Why? Because the underpinning of these types of diseases are actually born from our lifestyle, just as how infectious diseases were born from pathogens. And so we look at this whole list here. And just to give an example, we look at heart disease and we say that heart disease takes away about 650,000 lives every year, which is more than two times COVID at this point. However, we don't have that kind of response to the impact 
even though the impact is the same or even worse. With that COVID, people can recover. We see that actually a majority of people do recover. Um, the, the issue is when they have chronic diseases that the severity of the disease becomes an issue. Um, but people don't have that kind of response to chronic diseases, even though the impact is as deadly um, with that being early disease and suffering. So what are we really looking at when we look at chronic disease in America? So here are some statistics. And the best way that I would describe these statistics are striking. That's the word that I would use to describe this. This is extremely striking. And so we see that six in 10 adults have a chronic disease and four in 10 adults have not just one, but two or more. So what exactly is that saying? How do we translate that information? What that actually means is that most Americans are ill. Almost every other American is really ill. And so you can understand that we're actually dealing with a crisis here. There is no way around it. And when we think about the warning signs, when we think about what tells us how serious the situation is, the warning sign is actually the youth um, of this country. It's pretty clear, the reality, um, looking at the health statistic of America's young people. Because if our young are sick, what does that mean for our future as a country? What does that mean for their future as well? And so if we take a closer look, we see um, that about 20% of children have excess weight that poses a risk to their health, which is how we define obesity. Once excess weight is classified as obesity, it means that weight is now powerful. Weight has power. It has the ability to exert effect on your health and it starts to have a real impact on your health. So if that's 20% as young people, what does that trajectory look like in adulthood for this population? And about a third of children have weight above the healthy threshold, which overweight is a stepping stone to obesity that we have defined as excess weight that poses a risk to one's health. And now Houston, we have a problem because adult diseases were considered adult diseases for a reason. And this quote from the CDC sums it up very well. Until recently, young children and teens almost never got type two diabetes, which is why it is used, it used to be called um, adult onset diabetes. But now about one third of American youth are overweight and a problem closely related to um, the increase in kids is with type two diabetes some as young as 10 years old. So myself, I'm an internist. That means that I see adults. So I see individuals who are 18 to 100 or plus. We definitely have centenarians who um, live past 100. But now we're actually seeing um, the pediatric population, these types of diseases that were once considered not possible in the pediatric population. So how did we get here? Well, per decades of research and public health efforts, we have a very clear understanding that key lifestyle behaviors have serious impacts on our health. And we see that tobacco use, poor nutrition, lack of physical activity, excessive alcohol use, and um, as we talk more about the pillars of lifestyle medicine will include sleep and stress management because they are the underpinnings of the mechanisms of the specific mechanisms of poor nutrition etc. And we have identified that these are the actual causes of most chronic diseases. So yes, these individual behaviors are the underlying mechanisms of poor health in the US. But how did we really get here? So we think about um, the kind of decline we have had in just behaviors that actually support us, support us as a society in being able to live well, why is it important to have health? Well, you are able to live a good life. You are able to contribute as you would want to in your life. You're able to contribute to society. So one area that we've seen a significant change in just, is just in physical activity. And that's as a result of the modernization of our society, where now we are mostly sitting down and um, sedentary behavior has gone from being something that was the minority to the norm. And here's just a, a graph of that, or I should say a chart of that, a table that shows us this 
incredible decrease. <laughs> Once we move from preteen ages, where usually we're engaging in about an hour of physical activity a day, that's no more. It, it drops dramatically from 42 minutes to about eight on a daily basis. That would be the average um, of your average American. And this, these are statistics from the CDC. So we have that, you know, we've seen that physical activity is something um, that has been affected. Then we look at the type of food environment that we are in. And so we've really embraced a certain type of food environment you now that was not normal before because we've actually been able to change foods from what they um, naturally are and how they, come, how they come to us in nature. And so we've seen these changes in our eating patterns. We've seen an increased consumption of high caloric beverages, increased snacking, increased consumption of animal source foods where that becomes predominantly what people eat versus plant foods, which are the only sources of the actual cellular machinery that allow your body to function properly. Um, the increased intake of ultra processed foods, the reduced intake of fruits, veggies, and legumes, which are the underpinnings of lots of successful some civilizations around the world, and increased use of pre-cooked foods. Not that there's a problem with those, but we see that there's a significant difference in the type of quality of those foods that are tend to be pre-made. And in addition to the type of food that we're eating, the amount of food that we're eating has also significantly changed, where we see that increased portion sizes have been normalized. Back in the 1960s, this is the amount of food that we used to consume on a regular basis, but with the nature of um, how food is produced at this point as a result of actually the industrial revolution and mass production and the, um, the, the, the lucrative nature of the food industry, um, the portion sizes have increased. So now this is our new normal, consuming a large amount of food um, on a regular basis. And lastly, I just want to point out the impact of marketing, which has been a significant driver to the way that we eat because it creates culture, it creates norms around what we do. And so the power of marketing has power. And I know that you, many of you have probably heard of this or been exposed to this information, but about $1.8 billion are spent every year on um, uh, marketing to children. And we look and see the difference between what type of marketing goes towards unhealthy food and what kind of marketing goes towards healthy food. And that is a difference of almost, I mean, I don't know how you would even characterize that. So it's about a 100th amount is spent on healthy food versus $1.7 billion spent on unhealthy food. And so we, we see the numbers here. It's very clear that marketing is very effective and why? Because we see um, the, the impact, we see the consequences in the numbers, we see the consequences in the profits. And research shows us that marketing has an impact on our behaviors, on our eating behaviors, on our lifestyle behaviors. So the, market, the power of marketing creates this type of situation that everywhere you go, you're getting messages all day long telling you how to behave. And our current reality looks like this. In the last 30 years, obesity rates have doubled in adults, tripled in children, quadrupled in adult, um, adolescents. And this trajectory is not stopping anytime soon. And so we have to actually think about what we are dealing with. We really have to think about the reality that we're in. And no other reality really characterizes, characterizes the crisis that we're in better than the COVID pandemic that we are currently experiencing. And in this pandemic, um, we have seen the impact of environment. We've seen the impact of community. We've seen the impact of culture. Because when we look at what the COVID um, pandemic has um, not unearthed, because I would say health disparities have been here since the 1990s when the first report by the Institute of Medicine titled um, it was um, essentially on um, health disparities, unequal treatment was what it was called. It already told us that health disparities were evident and very much present in the environment, but we really have not done much to change the needle on this issue. And so we see now, because this kind of um, topic has been brought to the forefront so um, 
so so strongly and we see this kind of impact just from the covid tracking project here this number has stayed consistent throughout this experience about 1.9 times the rate is um, the death rate of black individuals compared to um, whites from COVID. And why is that? Well, the underpinning, as I kind of um, mentioned earlier, is that COVID um, is a respiratory, it's a, it's a virus. And um, the main kind of disease manifestation is respiratory illness. And we understand that for many different types of viruses, the having a chronic disease is already a risk factor for you to have severe um, uh, the severe course of the disease, as well as an increased likelihood of mortality. And so we look at health disparities and we understand why it is that we're seeing this pattern with COVID, because it's the same pattern that we see with chronic diseases across the country in pretty much every area that you have um, a diversity of, um, of uh, ethnicities and races, you see that among this group, um, black individuals um, mainly are the, um, the individuals that have the highest death rates, but that also includes people of color where this, there's a spectrum. And essentially people of color are the ones that bear the brunt of the effect of chronic diseases. And this spans different age groups as well, where you can see that compared to um, white counterparts, African-American um, individuals continue to um, die at earlier ages from high blood pressure, diabetes, and stroke. And when we really think about what that manifests um, into, on, at the end of all of this, we're really thinking about life expectancy. And that life expectancy is the outcome of this type of um, disparity, where we see here that when we compare sexes, male and female, both um, um, Black females and Black males um, continue to have the lowest life expectancy across the board. And um, I'm only, I'm really painting a picture of the extremes where in terms of life expectancy, um, the population that has the lowest is um, African-American. Um, but that spectrum, again, we see the disparities evident in many communities of color, where for example, in the COVID pandemic, um, Latino communities have actually had the highest incidence of COVID. So they're contracting it um, more than other populations. And so we just see these disparities, meaning something is actually wrong with our system that needs to change. And the, the best way to describe that is that your zip code determines your health. Whoever thought that? Where you live? Didn't we say genes? Didn't we think you're rearing? You're, how, how you're nurtured? It's actually your physical environment. And we see that because right here, this is just a, um, a schematic from Robert Wood Johnson, a Robert Wood Johnson report. And we see here um, in this area, your life expectancy is 80 years, while in this area, which was just a stone throw away, this is in um, New Orleans, Louisiana, um, 55 is the life expectancy. That's close to a 30 year difference in the same area. So how did we really get here? It is community and culture and how it influences our individual behaviors. That is the underpinning of our individual behavior. So when people talk about, oh, I wish this you know, person would just get it together. You gotta work harder. You need to try harder. You're not doing what you're supposed to do. Um, patients hear that information many times from physicians and we're not thinking about the larger picture that we're actually in an environment that promotes um, disease. We're in an environment that promotes early death. We're in an environment that promotes disability. We're in an environment that promotes suffering. And that means that we actually have something that we can do about this when we understand what is actually at the root cause of these um, disparities and these outcomes and these trends. So the good news, um, actually, the first point is that when we kind of compare back to our historical context, we see that um, in our current time, the root cause of disease is poor lifestyle instead of an infectious pathogen. But the principle is still the same. Our environment, both physical and social, has impact on our health and preventative measures are again required to successfully address the current pandemic that we're experiencing, which is a pandemic of chronic disease that has really just facilitated the pandemic of um, COVID as we see it now, as we're experiencing. 
So what's the good news? I know I shared a lot of information with you that maybe wasn't so much good news, but what is the good news? The good news is that because we understand the root cause of our chronic disease epidemic, we can do something about it. And the information is so amazing. It's so compelling. It is so encouraging to know that 80% of heart disease and stroke are preventable. That 80% of type two diabetes is preventable. That 40% of cancers are preventable. And not just preventable, but they're treatable. And not just treatable, but they're reversible. This, these are experiences that I have had witnessing this type of um, transformation with patients and what happens when you actually remove food that the body is not designed to eat, which is the fact that with the current type of food environment that we live in, it is um, essentially processed foods that Americans consume on a regular basis. There was a USDA kind of schematic that showed about 60% of the foods that are com consumed by the American public are actually processed. They've been changed, modified in some way. So it's not necessarily our fault that we have um, these uh, choices. Of course, we have individual um, responsibilities, but our choices have been changed. And so what we have easily accessible to us um, also determines, again, our individual behavior. So what is lifestyle medicine? That is the answer to our current problem. And lifestyle medicine in the kind of specific definition um, is an evidence-based approach to preventing, treating, and even reversing diseases by replacing these unhealthy behaviors with ones that are healthy, yes, but they are actually natural. They're intuitive. They're what your body wants to do. Your body doesn't want to be sick. Your body's default is to be healthy. So when we see that we are living in an environment where disease is the common experience, we know that something is very wrong with the system that we live in. And so these six pillars of lifestyle medicine include physical activity, healthy eating, eating the foods that your body requires because inside of those foods are the very cellular machinery that allows your body to function properly, managing stress successfully, because stress is not something that you can take away. It's not supposed to go away. Your body has a natural stress response, which means that you are supposed to respond to stress. So the real issue is how do you learn how to respond to stress in a healthy manner? Social connection that is healthy, sleep that allows your body to repair itself and avoiding substances that actually damage your body. And when we look at lifestyle medicine, it's just getting at the root of being a human being. When we think about, and this is kind of my idea, um, my thoughts on it, when you're a human being, you consist of different elements, social, physical, spiritual, mental. Lifestyle medicine is literally just optimizing your, your experience as a human. You're just living well as a human being. And so the six measures of um, BPL are essentially the foundations of what um, lifestyle medicine um, is all about. And so how did we get here? Yes, we understand that it's these um, lifestyle behaviors um, that have facilitated this, but again, it is because of um, the type of environment that has facilitated this. And so we're not speaking about anything that's new or um, revolutionary in the sense of the information. Every major chronic disease guideline emphasizes lifestyle as the foundation of treatment. So why is it that we are not enforcing this? in the way that it should be enforced um, because we are challenged by an environment that facilitates um, disease. So just some examples, you know, um, guidelines on overweight and obesity management, hypertension, diabetes care, um, cardiovascular disease, and just a, a small example from the, that last um, guideline right here. Right here is where they talk about lifestyle and the diet um, that predominates in plants um, being the most um, recommended. So how does it for inf this information help us as students and educators? Well, a school is a community and a school is a culture. So the power of the school and a school environment and those that are members and um, contributors to the environment um, can have such an incredible impact on the type of behaviors that students can adopt early on that will make such an incredible difference in their lives as they move forward. And so schools have direct contact with um, about 95% of our nation's young people. 
Schools play an important role in promoting the health and safety of children and adolescents by establishing these kind of lifelong health patterns. Healthy students are better learners because healthy people are um, better people. <laughs> they can operate better as a person. Schools are ideal settings to teach these type of um, behaviors. And when school health policies and practices are put in place, students can effectively grow to be um, healthy and successful adults. So I really, I'm so excited about this opportunity with BPL. It's an opportunity to counter the effect of the current environment by creating a new one that will set students on track for excellent health in the future, that will just facilitate their um, contribution to this world. The type of students that I know come out of BPL are brilliant because the people in BPL are brilliant and good health allows for good well-being, quality of life, which allows them to be the game changers that they are going to be. So just um, to end with um, really giving honor to my aunts, um, this is my aunt Bev and my aunt Diane. Um, they are, were integral to my education in Jamaica. My aunt Bev was a principal of my prep school. My aunt Diane, who recently passed away in March, um, from leukemia, she was the sixth grade teacher. And these ladies taught me what I know about educators, which are that educators change the trajectory of their students' lives. And I think here is where um, we have an opportunity to have that impact on the maximal um, fullest level. So thank you so much for your time and thank you for listening. And I'm so happy to be a part of this community. No, thank you. We thank, thank you, you, Marsha Gale. Um, to make sure I can be heard. Uh, you just took us to church. And sometimes we just need to listen and now figure out how to apply it. Like all big picture learners, if we got some information, hopefully we'll be able to apply that information. Now I hear some students, um, I know we got some time things to figure out. So Elliot, I think we're still going with the students, right? Cause if so, yeah, yeah, we got, Elijah's uh, about to rock, right? We have uh, Elijah and Rocio. Uh, Elijah's been with us on our webinars talking about his uh, work around uh, physical well being and more. And Rocio has been working on, um, on a lot of things that she'll tell you about as she asks the question as well. So we could start off with those two students. You, you have a question? Oh, there they go, Rocio. Oh, yeah. Former podcasters with me. Good to see you again. That's right. Um, I can start off. So hi, everyone. My name is Rocio Rodriguez. Um, I'm very excited to be here. And my question is, um, as a student, what can I do or what can we do to um, help those with low income and those at my school with improving their nutrition? Time out. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's a question. Fuck it. That's right. Take it away. Um, well, thank you so much, Rocio. That is an awesome question. And um, I know that that's one of the challenges that we have um, facing us because we are dealing with an environment um, that has created kind of disparate um, situations. Um, however, I believe a lot in agency. I believe a lot in the agency of the person and I believe in the agency of community and the power of community to actually have impact. Um, and when we think about resources, um, that is a real challenge for, for when we know about food apartheid, where we have a combination of food deserts and we have a, um, food um, swamps where you find a large um, amount of um, unhealthy food that are in environments and a small amount of healthy foods. So that's like a real barrier that is there. However, um, we still have the opportunity, um, even across the the, the nation, um, that healthy eating is not considerably more expensive um, compared to um, unhealthy eating. It can seem that way, the perception of it. And I know it sounds like, wait, what is Dr. D was talking about? But some of the cheapest meals, beans and rice, um, are extremely healthy. They're very simple but they're very healthy. And those are options that people can have. There was um, actually a story of a guy who I read about, um, he lost about a hundred pounds by shopping at the 99 cent store and walking. 
every day. That was his mm. approach to changing his lifestyle. Um, and so I, I don't believe in that because I believe that's kind of like almost the equivalent to voter suppression. Um, you're telling people there's nothing you can do. Um, yeah, your vote doesn't count. So sorry, can't really change your situation. But that's it's almost like saying, yeah, you don't have an opportunity to change your lifestyle by saying, oh, healthy eating is so expensive. It is doable. It does take more time. And of course, we need that kind of change in the environment to help us to facilitate healthy eating as the norm. Um, but there, we coming together as a community with your fellow students, um, discussing types of recipes that you can, can cook together. You can create kind of a database of recipes or even, um, and there's so much information now with YouTube, with social media, you can find stuff all over the internet. Um, there are resources that are available. There are resources that I can share as well. Um, but I think that the power of the community allows you to um, be able to do much as students. And one other thing is that as a student, your voice, just sharing this information, just saying this is important for us, this is important for me, this is important for my fellow students, this is important for my family, um, that has an Im Im impact. Your voice alone has an impact. Uh, Elijah, you got a question? I, is Elijah here, the brother? I think, yeah, I think I'm right here. Oh yeah. Okay. This is the voice. That is you the like voice. Would you like me to introduce you. myself first? Good to see you again. Would you like me to introduce myself first or? You can say we're school and let's do the question, brother. Let's do it. Okay. Well, my name is Elijah Bradford and I'm from Innovations High School in Reno, Nevada. And my question is, how have you seen this pandemic impact students' health across the nation? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. All right. That was a good one too, Elijah. All right, you got it. <laughs> you know, I think, I think the the biggest impact has actually been mental health um, and uh, managing stress, because as a young person, your ability to spend time with other young people is really crucial um, in that you know in that um, part of your development and. That's been what I've heard, really um, observed has been um, really one of the, the largest um, challenges is just being able to have um, that kind of quality time that you can spend with others. And because we're disconnected in some way, though Zoom does facilitate connection. It, it is not the same. It does facilitate connection though. Um, so I think the biggest thing is mental health. And I think a lot of us are learning about how we manage stress during this time and how we focus on certain things, um, how a situation can really affect us. And it really, it really highlights how important it is for us to actually learn stress management tools, which are effective. That's why we talk about them. And I, as a culture, we don't actually know how to do that. Hmm. Nice one. Elliot, we rocking anymore? Yeah, By the no, way, this I, makes me- yeah, we are. We got to. We're gonna do go. We we got an hour and fifteen, but we'll probably go hour and ten. Um, we we'll okay. want to. I just want to say thanks to um, our adults, Dan and Amanda, who are here, and Paul and Andrew and Freddie, who have been organizing. Students are getting everybody ready on the webinars and stuff. And now Andrew. We're yeah, we're going to breakout rooms where students are going to facilitate adults around how we bring these six measures into your school culturally. Out to Elliot, could I do the flip? Families. What? I, could I do the flip for them? So basically yeah. what Elliot is saying is, so what you going to do about it? Like, That's what right. you going to do about it? Like, now that you know this, now that you know some stuff, how are you gonna apply it in your in your location, your school, or what little thing can you do? How can you break through? So we're gonna go into breakouts for five, come back and close it out. <laughs>